Thanks for joining us for today's message. If you'd like to support this resource and others like it, you can do so by visiting our website, thechapel.cc, and select the giving option that works best for you. Enjoy the message. Great to have you. Man, the weather is fantastic. Right, oh, so, so good. It's gonna snow Friday. Anyway, take out your worship guide that you were given this morning. I want to continue with this thought um, that uh, we had a couple of weeks ago about uh, living the salt life. And of course, Floridians, we know, as Floridians, we know what this is. It's kind of this, this mentality, this kind of way of life that you see on four by fours and trucks and, and cars about salt life, beach life, about, about this, this type of living when you uh, live, this mentality that you have when you live by the water. And what we discovered is that early on in Jesus' ministry, Jesus was calling us as believers and followers to the salt life. And what we said, and we covered some territory already, what we said was that in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus starts one of his most historic messages called Sermon on the Mount. And he starts, he gathers, people are gathering because of, of who he is and they've heard the prophecies and they've heard his reputation already and they gather. And, and he starts teaching the people, hey listen, this is what it's going to be like when you believe and follow. This is what it's going to be like when you follow the ways of the kingdom, of my, of my kingdom. And he says, blessed more than happy, blessed are the peacemakers. Not that we're doormats as, as Christians or believers and followers, but, but blessed, more than happy, when you don't jump into the fray of something, you are a catalyst for calming tumultuous times. Not a, not a doormat, but you don't just get on, jump on the bandwagon. Um, he says, more than happy, blessed are the people who uh, like have a, an appetite or a thirst for the right kind of living. And he starts going through this, it's known as the Beatitudes. And this is early on in Jesus' ministry. And he's trying to teach the people how to live. He's trying to teach believers and followers how to live the best life possible. And he just says, this is what it's, it's, it's going to be like. And what we discovered is at the end of this, it's kind of like this message that he does that he says, Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, he says, you are salt. He's like, he makes this declarative statement. You are salt of the earth and light of the world. And what we discovered was the audience was kind of like weird. The audience had disciples in it who were ordinary, not necessarily schooled or specially skilled people. What we said was that to Jesus, from Jesus' perspective, believers and followers are influencers. And he said, what you're doing is you're, you'll begin to disqualify yourself about making a difference in this world or culture or society. You'll disqualify yourself about making a difference for the kingdom of God, even in your own family, because you think it's based on your behavior. You think it's based on what I have or I don't have, what kind of pedigree I come from, what kind of education. And Jesus immediately says to this, really this, this band of people that have no special gifts that are early on in their relationship with God, it's not based on who you are or what you have or don't have it's based on how I see you you're salt of the earth it's almost like this is Jesus expectation of who we are it's, it's Jesus expectation of of what believers oh no you thought it was you needed to, to memorize the book of John first although that's great but it's not based on that you're salt because that's who you are you can't earn already who you are you just are and we discover that Jesus really, we're just, we're influencers and we all have influence. No matter what season of life we're in, no matter our socioeconomic background, our cultural background, we all have influence. And Jesus is saying, no, I know that. That's, I've created it that way. You're supposed to use that influence. You're, you're salt. And lie, you're so, and, and then we discovered like salt, out of all the things Jesus could have said, salt. 
So, so here we go. We, we said that an attribute, what Jesus was saying is salt in biblical times, and sometimes even today, salt was to preserve and stop the decay. Because the disciples and people would have known, oh, salt, wow, that's weird that he called me. What did he just call me, salt? That, so when they would fish, they couldn't keep fish because there was no whirlpool refrigerator in the back of the tent, right? So what they would do is they would take the fish that they caught, the multiple, and they would pack it in salt to stop the decay and preserve what would be held, holding them as sustenance for days to come. And what we find now is Jesus saying, this is what you are. And we realize that living the salt life wasn't as like laid back and, yo, bro, it wasn't as laid back and, uh, as we thought. It was actually more difficult when we take it from Jesus' perspective. He said, no, what you are is you're the ones that preserve the ways of the kingdom. Think of the context. Because he just started telling people what it's like to believe and follow and the life that you can expect. You're the ones in culture and society that preserve the way of the kingdom. You're the ones in culture that stops the decay. And I think in all of our worlds, at some level, we can see that society and culture is somewhat decaying. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Well, you're, you're, but you're salt. You preserve the kingdom. You, you through your action, through, you through your influence, stop the decay. Don't add to it. Don't contribute to it. Oh, but you, you, you're salt. And don't, whatever you do, don't think it's your salt because of all the great things you're doing or all the gifts you have or don't have or all the talents that you have or don't have. Don't think that. It's not based on you. It's based on how I see you. You're the ones to stop the decay of culture. See, we have a tendency, what we discovered was to disqualify ourselves. Only people disqualifying ourselves from being used by God is us because he took care of everything on the cross. That is why he said it is finished. So, so let's, let's, let's continue. You are. Something that preserves and stops decay. The other thing salt does is this, creates a thirst. And we said the reason why salt life was so difficult is because we needed to ask ourselves some questions. This is what Jesus wanted us to do. Why did I call you salt? Well, ask yourself this. Think of salt. Where in my life, where with the influence that I have at whatever level, my husband, my wife, my kids, my grandkids, nieces, nephews, car line, corporation, doesn't matter. Where am I using my influence to preserve the ways of the kingdom and stop the decay. Where am I using my influence, whether it's a student or a grandmother, that creates a thirst for the kingdom of God, for the things? Where am I creating a thirst? In? Raise your hand if you love sushi. Go ahead, say it. Just say it. Do it, do it all over the room. That's right. Be honest in church because a lightning bolt will come down and strike you dead. Here's right, just the, who, who doesn't like I can't do sushi? Who does? Oh, quite a few more people. You are a sinner. Okay? Here's the deal because sushi is exactly the way God intended for us to eat food. It is fantastic. It is so, so good. I mean, this is what we know. Trisha and I were out, my wife and I were out a couple of weeks ago with some friends and we had sushi. And my wife looks petite and small, but that woman can pound some sushi. I'm just telling you right now. And of course, it's just a great time just eating. Oh my goodness, just good. And then what happens after that? You're like, you can't, you, you're dried out. You can't. And then two hours later, I burn the sushi off talking at dinner. Does that make sense? So you stop at Taco Bell on the way home. You gotta, you gotta top the tank off, you know what I mean? But sushi's so fantastic, but what it does is it makes you incredibly thirsty. You wake up in the middle of the night, and you're like, because I just, and this is what Jesus is saying, that's what salt does. Salt creates a thirst. It's supposed to create a thirst in people. How they see you and what they hear from you should, Jesus is saying, you should be creating a thirst in them for the kingdom. And, and this is what we forget. We, 
during uh, biblical times when, when much of the Bible were written in this era of the world, it was polytheistic, meaning there were multiple gods for multiple things. A god of the moon, this is how the world looked. God of the moon, god of the sun. God of the crops, god of the rain, god of the clouds, god of sex. And then out of nowhere comes this little tribe of people from this country called Israel. And they go, no, 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 no. We got something revolutionary. There's not many gods for many things. There is only one God for everything and everyone, and his name is Yahweh. Revolutionary. And how the kingdom of God moved and caused someone who was worshiping another god through a nasty, demonic religion to leave that way of life and start following the kingdom of God. All they had, they didn't have cool bumper stickers. They didn't have Joy FM. Thank God. No, I'm just kidding. Listen, love Joy FM. Stop. Stop it. Stop. There are some people who go to our church who work at Joy FM. That's why I said it. I would like them to play one Metallica song. That's all I would like. That's all I'm saying. Thank you. Thank you. I shouldn't say that. That's horrible. I've written a lot of good messages to Metallica, just so you know. And you've left going, that was so godly. <laughs> See? Listen. <laughs> How they moved from a direction that God did not want them to go to living in their purpose-filled life that God intended was they would look at this tribe of people called the Jewish people and the way that they lived was so compelling, was so loving and so caring and so selfless that they went, I don't know what I've been spending my whole life on, but man, that looks so good. How do I become part of that? <laughs> because they created a thirst in people. So this is why the salt life isn't just like, ah. Oh. This is why it's so difficult. The salt life that Jesus calls us to. Because what we should be asking is, through what I do and through the words that I say, what thirst am I creating in people? That's why Jesus said, you, you, but you're salt. Create in them. You know, we, what I have found is we create in our children, grandkids, a lot of appetites, a lot of thirsts. Hit the ball over the fence, catch the ball, run fast, hit a touchdown. Yeah, great. Get a great education. Get a fantastic job. We want you to be successful. Absolutely. We create a lot of thirsts in our kids to achieve. None of those things are wrong. The problem is sometimes it's the only thing we want and create a thirst in them for. And what Jesus is saying, that's fine, but you're salt. Oh, you're not basing it on your perfection or lack of sin, are you? Of course not, right. Because this is who you are. It's how I see you. You're meant to use whatever level of influence you have in whatever season of life you're in. You're meant to create a thirst for Christ in what you do and what you say. That people will, it's how the kingdom moved. It's how the kingdom moved forward. They went, oh, I got to be, look at this, look at how they, look at how they sold everything they had and met each other's needs. Look at how they worshiped together. Can I just tell you a side note? How many people I have met in our church that started coming because they said they hadn't seen the parking lot this full at this location in years upon years. And we went, we just had to check it out. Is that a thirst? Jesus says you just get to create, because you're salt, you, you, you create a thirst. So you have, well, you have to ask, I wonder what, I wonder, I wonder what thirst is being created in my family. If they would appear in and they would have mentioned and write down or text me with no fear of repercussion for what they text, what would they be saying that we're modeling as fathers and mothers and but bigger as believers? And Jesus is saying, you, you're a soul. You, you create a thirst in people by you using your influence. Here's, here's a, a great scripture. 
John 7, 38. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within who? Them. It's just a given. It's just understood. It's, it's just understood that as believers and followers, people and culture are thirsty for authentic love, for authentic grace, for authentic forgiveness, authentic truth. They're thirsty for this. It's just given for the early believers and followers that if when you started following Christ, believing and following, that you would have this living water that would begin to quench the thirst of culture and society. It was just a given. Whoever believes, let me tell you, one of the things, one of the attributes, whoever believes in me and follows, you're going to be like this. You're going to have like living waters flow from you. Because people are thirsty, man. You've got to create a thirst in them for the way I created them to live. You have to create a thirst in them for authentic, true relationship. God's not over there. God's right here. For authentic, true relationship. It creates this, this, this thirst, salt does. Uh, here's something else. Uh, salt <laughs> brings out flavor. It brings out the flavor. See, salt actually works internally. Salt works internally. Anything that's, when you take salt and you apply it to something, it works. What salt does is it already brings out what is already there. What salt does is it works within the mass that it touches and it brings out what's already there. So what happens is in what we say and in what we do. I took a couple of days off this week, so I'm really rested. Send me emails, please. <laughs> the problem we think sometimes in marriages is inappropriate boundaries that have been crossed in whatever manner. And that is true, it's inappropriate, it shouldn't happen. But we're dealing with symptoms. We're not dealing with issues. And one of the issues we have in relationships that are close, in marriages that are happening, listen to me, is we get to a level of complacency and we're not, we're, our minds are not focused on bringing out the best in what God has already put in our husband and wife. That's the issue sometimes. And we're not focusing. Meanwhile, Jesus says, oh, don't, don't base what you are based on you. You base, you base what you are on how I see you. You're a salt. You bring out the flavor. It's internal. Just, just li listen. Years ago, my first pastor, he would, he would come over our house. My wife was active in church. She was at church. She's a holy roller. And he'd come over. And he said, hey, you want to go on a motorcycle ride? I don't want to go on a motorcycle ride with you. I didn't like the guy, okay? He just, he but I just wanted to come by, I wanted to stop by. And you know, you got a gift. You got a gift with people. What? He goes, yeah, you remember, you know, your wife told me you read this scripture and you wrote this down. Where did you get that thought from? I don't know, I just get these thoughts. And he goes, huh. He goes, I've never read that before, that's awesome. All right, you're not going on a motorcycle ride? No. All right, I'll see you next week at church. No, no actually you won't, I'm traveling. Okay, week after week after week after week. He'd sit at my table and he'd go, let me tell you something about you. At one point, he actually said, he goes, you can run things for the kingdom of God. And I went, what? He goes, yeah, you need to come work at our church. I go, hey, brother, you can't afford me. Don't make a comment on that because now I'm your pastor. What does that say about you? <laughs> so I said, yeah, week after week. Why? He's bringing out. He's pulling out. He's bringing out the flavor God already put in. See, we, we, we tend to forget this. I want you to imagine. I want you to imagine the, the person you know right now who is the furthest from God. Just think about who that person is. You might have multiple people. Think about who that person is who is the furthest from God that you could even think. Yeah. 
Never forget that that person furthest from God that you're thinking about is still a son and daughter of the most high God. And we have been placed in a position of influence, either small or great, to bring out. The book of Peter says this, inside of you, believer and follower of Christ, is an incorruptible seed. And Jesus says, hey, you're the one to cultivate that. You're the one to bring out that flavor. You're the one. That's who you are. Oh, oh, you're not, because you think you're not perfect? Because you think you're going to feel like a hypocrite? Because you're going to think like that? The only person making an excuse to be used by God to be who he says we are is you. Because all of those excuses were taken care of on the cross with his resurrection. That's why he says it early on in the ministry. Because i got to tell you right now who you are. Because as you grow and as you get older, other people are going to start to define you. Let me define you first and it'll stick. He says, no, no, no. You're so, you bring out the flavor in people. Here's a scripture. Paul, talking to the church, he says this. Hebrews 10, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. What? Let us, let us consider. It means you have to think about it. You have to be deliberate. It means you have to be a deliberate about saying, hey, you know what? Considering that words only do two things in God's economy, right? They either kill something or make something come alive. So, hey, you know what you're really good at? Wow, how come you don't pursue? You know what I noticed about you? You are so great with kids. You know what I saw? You know what I, every time I hear you talk, I think, yeah, because that's what salt does. It brings out something that God has already put there. It brings out the flavor. It brings out, listen, you know what it does? What salt does, because it works in internally, what it does is it brings out the purpose. It brings out, it brings out people's purpose because God has already gifted them with gifts. Listen, I, I want us to get this. I, I, I want us to get this. If there's only one thing we get, it's this. Paul talking to the early church at Ephesus. Same person who said, let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. To a different church, he says this. Uh, Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer. Aren't we so glad we have evolved, right? Because they stole things back then. Crazy, crazy society they were, right? Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer. Stealing, bad, don't do it anymore, stop. He says, just stop it. Don't steal any longer. But then he says this amazing statement. But must work doing something useful with their own hands. Hey, real quick, what else do you steal with? I guess people could steal with their feet. That would be weird, but I guess. But, but why does he have to say hands? What, the, the, it, it would have made perfect sense to turn around and say, but they must work doing something useful to share with those in need. But he says and he mentions hands because he fully and totally understands the meaning of what Christ said to early believers and followers about salt bringing out, because culturally salt bringing out people's purpose. Culturally, we know this, historians, through historical data, that three things would have happened for those who were thieves biblically. Depending on the level of larceny, they could have spent anywhere between one month to 15 years in prison. Second thing is they would cut off a finger. Third thing is they would cut off a hand. This is the context in culture that this was written to. And Paul says, no, 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 no. Don't cut their finger or hand off. Don't imprison them. Don't do that. The reason why they're stealing is because it's the best thing that they can think of to do with their hands. Don't do that. Don't stop it. Find a greater purpose. Find a greater purpose for what they're doing. No, let them use those hands to do something that will change other people's lives. Bring out the purpose because they want to use those. Bring out the purpose inside of people. And that's why we spend so much time in growth track, which this week, 
after third service at 1245 in building B, give us four weeks to find out why God has wired you a certain way to cry and breaks your heart. Why God has, makes you joyful when you hear or see certain things. Really what this scripture says, it's like it's just the best thing that they can think of. They don't know any better. It's the only thing they know. Teach them to redirect that energy, that desire, that passion. Teach them. Because what will happen is unfulfilled purpose turns into destructive behavior. And I just pulled one story. Because inside of people, from the person who is the furthest from God to the person who believes they're closer to God today than ever before, there is a divine purpose placed in their heart and in their mind and in the soul of their being by Christ Almighty. And what salt does, which you and I are, is what's meant to bring it out. Bring that out on how we may spur one another on to love and good deeds. Don't. Why are you stealing? <laughs> Paul just reaches down deep inside and he goes, there's a better purpose for what you're doing. See, because inside there's this, um, how would you say it? There's this horsepower that God has put. Listen, and I'm not talking, I found my purpose. I got a boat. I'm not talking about that. Not wrong with a boat. I, I found my purpose. I love my job. We're not talking about that. I love, I, I, I found my purpose. I build houses for Habitat for Humanity. Awesome. Great. We're talking about the God-given purpose. The God-given purpose. God-given purpose provides and produces godly fruit. It's one of the things this weekend that I need uh, to remember because sometimes uh, this job gets hard for me. And when I hear about our Thanksgiving outreach to families in our community, we're not a government program that hands out meals. Why? It's because there's a special place every time we reach out into the community, which, by the way, we served over 700 people in six and a half hours. Yeah, that's right. But what's crazy, what's crazy is what you find is believers and followers who call the chapel home, you find them praying with people. I'm providing this meal because God Almighty has provided for me. I'm providing this love and care and respect because of how great our God is. Do you know my God? That's the kind of purpose that Jesus is talking about. That's linked to moving the kingdom forward. Nothing wrong with any of those things. That's awesome to do. But let's talk about what God placed in you. He says, no, what you do is you, you preserve the ways of the kingdom. You stop the decay of culture. You create a thirst by what your grandkids, by what your kids, by what your wife, by what your husband sees and hears from you. You create a thirst for the kingdom. And then... What salt does is salt just changes what it touches. You cannot apply salt anywhere where it doesn't change something. You cannot, and it might seem rudimentary, but Christianity was never supposed to be a subculture. It was never meant to be a subculture, less than, an offshoot of this is why Jesus says, you are in the world, but you're not of the world. You're not born of this culture. You're not shaped and molded by this culture. You are in the culture to change culture and society for the kingdom as you preserve and you stop decay and you create a thirst and you bring out flavor. He says, no, you see, salt just changes what it touches. And unfortunately, what hap has happened in our culture is that uh, being politically correct has shut up a lot of Christians. The problem is most Christians don't know how to speak the truth in love. We were never meant to not speak truth, but we were directed by God Almighty to speak the truth in love. 
Several months ago, I had this conversation with somebody in our church, people in our church, and they're like, hey, so we went through Girl Track. I said, oh, it's fantastic. Well, we're sitting having coffee, and they go, listen, we don't believe the only way to get to heaven is through Jesus. I took my coffee, I threw it at them. <laughs> I crushed up my scone at Starbucks. You will burn in everlasting hell. No. I was like, really? Hey, so tell me about that. What is that, what's that about? They started telling a couple of crystals and passages you read from great philosophers. And yeah, okay, cool. Well, we don't believe that. But, uh, you know, have you tried the chocolate scone? I mean, have you tried? Why does it have to be weird? Why does it have to be bombastic? Why does it have to be hateful? We don't. And then I, I equate it to me because I'm having to be. I don't believe that. That's not how I believe God created us to live. That's not how I believe he wired me. That's not our vision for our church. That is not, I'm, okay, yours is yours, awesome. Ours is this. Are you paying for coffee or am I? <laughs> Why does that have to be bombastic? Why does that have to be bad? And I can still love you and vehemently disagree with you. See, what, what culture will do is teach you Teach you that if you disagree, you must not love. <laughs> well, who, who said that? It changes. Salt changes what it touches. Salt just changes what it touches. I hope that you can call the chapel your home, but we fundamentally have some deep seated misalignment in your theology. But our doors are always open. But this is what we believe. Let me pay for your coffee. Because salt changes what it touches. Don't let political correctness silence you. We were never meant to be silenced. Christianity was never meant, but we were meant to love unconditionally. And we were meant to speak the truth in love. Salt just it changes what it touches. It just does. Oh, you think I don't love you because I disagree with you? They, they couldn't believe it. They were waiting for an argument. One of the, they were leaned over the table like this. I just thought they were close talk, and then they moved back, and I thought, did my breath stink? They were just, they were like leaned for an argument. Relax, try the decaf. <laughs> That'd be weird. Now, if you want to fight, catch me on another day. There are days I like to fight. <laughs> then all of a sudden, Jesus makes this statement. Let me tell you also what you are. You are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. What he says is, you, you're, you're like this light that shines. You're like this light that's on a, on a hill. That's what you are. See, what Jesus begins to say is, you're, you're this light, because biblically, one of, the, one, of, one of the things with light, what they used in Bible times, is, is what it would do is it would illuminate. It would illuminate a path that was right in front of people. It would illuminate just the first couple of steps, just the first couple of steps, because if you'd illuminate the whole thing, you wouldn't need faith. And that's why later in the Bible it says, it is impossible to please God without faith. That's why you're a lamp, that's why you're a candle. Just illuminating the next step for people. That's just what you do, that's what your life is. You just illuminate a pathway for the kingdom of God. So when there's trouble in a marriage and they're having tumultuous times and they don't know why they fell in love, you're light to the kingdom of God, you're light to the path. You don't hook them up on Tinder and say, hey, start looking for other people. Yeah. You, you, let that sink in a minute. No, no, because let me tell you what you are. You, you light the path. That's what you do, because it's, let me tell you, and whatever you do, whatever you do, do not put your light under a bushel or a bowl. Whatever you do, don't put your light under a bushel or a bowl. Get this, because if you do that, guys, guys, if you do that, people will learn to live in the darkness. Don't hide the light, because what they'll do is they'll get acclimated. 
They'll learn to live and move around relationally, sexually, financially, socially. They'll learn how to live in darkness. Don't hide it. But what he says is what you got to do is you got to illuminate. The higher light is lifted, the more it shows the path. He says, no, don't you know? You're salt and light. I don't want people to learn how to live in darkness. No. And, and the plan is for you to be that light. And Jesus says, whatever you do, don't think it's about you. It's about how I see you. Because Jesus says, you are salt of the earth. And you are the light of the world. Amen? Bow your heads, let me pray for you. Thank you, Lord, so much that we hear your word that we can hear your voice through your word. And Lord, this week, you're providing, you're showing us, Lord, an opportunity that through our influence at whatever level where, you ever, where you've placed us, God, that we move the kingdom forward, we preserve, we stop decay, we create a thirst for relationship with you. Lord, we bring out the best, the godly seed that you've put in people. We bring out the best in them in our families, in our community, in our neighborhoods, with our extended family during the holidays, Lord. Give us the strength. Give us the strength, Lord, not to be moot, but to change with what you've given us the ability to be around with our influence. Lord, teach us about light. Teach us where we need to let our, our light just lift it up a little bit more. Teach us how to love people the way you love us. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.